Don't you think that it is a great deal of wasting energy when you clap? Because this is not, if I may point out, an entertainment. This is a very serious affair to which you have to give your whole attention and not get emotional or enthusiastic about it. So I would suggest, if I may, that you refrain from clapping and indulging in emotional orgy and taking what is being said very seriously. We will continue, if we may, with what we were talking about the other day when we met here. We were considering the extraordinary complexity of life, the life that one leads every day, the strife, the conflict, the misery and the confusion that one is in. And until one really understands this complexity, what is the nature and the structure of it, how one is caught in the trap of it, there is no freedom. Not only the freedom to inquire, but the freedom that comes with great joy, in which there is total self-abandonment. And this is not possible, as we were saying the other day, if fear in any form exists either superficially or in the deep recesses of one's own mind. We pointed out the relationship between fear, pleasure and desire. To understand fear, one must also understand the whole nature of pleasure, which we somewhat went to, into the other day. And this morning, we would like to talk about the center from which our life and our activity takes place and whether it is at all possible to change the very center from which such activities take place. Because change is obviously necessary. a transformation, a revolution, an inward revolution. And to realize that revolution, that transformation, one must examine very closely what our life is, 
not escape from it, not indulge in theoretical beliefs and dogmas and assertions, but merely observe very closely what our life actually is and whether it is possible to transform that completely. In the transformation of it, you may affect the nature and the culture of society, and there must be change in society, because there are so many evils, social injustices, appalling travesty of virtue, and so on. But the change in society is of secondary importance that will come about naturally, inevitably, when you, as a human being in relationship with another, bring about this change in oneself. So we are going to consider this morning three essential things. What is living, the life that we lead every day, and what it means, compassion, love? And the other thing is, what is death? They are all closely related. In understanding the One, We'll understand the, the other two. You cannot, as we have seen, take fragments of life or choose a part of life you think is worthwhile or what appeals to you or what your tendency demands. Either you take the whole of life in which is involved death, love and living, or you merely take a fragment of it which may be satisfactory but will inevitably bring about greater confusion. So we must take the whole of it and not a segment of it, a part of it. So in considering what is living, we, we must bear in mind that we are not discussing it as a partial affair, but a whole, sane and a holy affair. So what is it that we call living? As one observes <coughs> in daily life, which is the life <coughs> of relationship, in that relationship there is conflict, pain, suffering. And that is what we call living. This constant dependence on another, in which there is self pity and comparison. Please, as we said the other day, and let me again repeat, if you will bear with it, that we are not concerned with theories, that we are not propagating any idea or any ideology, 
for all ideologies are obviously idiotic. They have no value whatsoever. On the contrary, they bring about greater confusion, greater conflict. So we are only concerned with actually what is, and to see that the what is can be transformed or not, and nothing else. So we are not indulging in opinion, in evaluation, no, in condemnation. We are solely concerned with the observation of what actually takes place, and to see if that can be transformed. One can see very clearly in one's daily life what a mess our life is, how contradictory. How confused! A life as it is lived now is absolutely meaningless. You may invent a meaning, and the intellectuals do invent a meaning, and the poor people follow those, that meaning because the intellectuals produce a very clever philosophy out of nothingness. Whereas, if we are only concerned with what is, and not invent a significance or an escape, and be tremendously aware that we do not escape, that we do not indulge in theories or ideologies, then our mind is capable of facing what is. Because theories, beliefs and philosophies do not change our life. We have had philosophies, beliefs, religions, and all the rest of it for mil thousands and thousands of years. And actually, they have not changed man. They have perhaps given him a superficial polish. Is less, perhaps, we say perhaps, less savage, but he's still brutal, violent, capricious not capable of sustained seriousness. And we have lived this kind of life, a life of great sorrow, from the moment we are born till we die. That is the fact. And no amount of speculative theories about the fact will affect the fact. What affects the fact, the what is, is the capacity, the energy, the intensity, the passion with which you look at that fact. And you cannot have passion. The intensity, if your mind is chasing, running away after some delusion, a speculative ideology. So please, this morning, as we are going to go into something rather complex, and life is complex, 
You need all your energy, all your attention. Not only while you are here in this hall, but also throughout life, if you are at all serious. What we are concerned with is the changing what is, the sorrow, the conflict, the violence, the dependence on another, not on the grocer, not on the doctor, not on the postman, but the dependence in our relationship with another, both psychologically as well as psychosomatically. This dependence on another will invariably breed fear. Because as long as I depend on you to sustain me emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, or what you will, as long as I depend on you, I am your slave, and therefore there is fear. This is a fact. And most human beings depend on another emotionally, psychologically. And in this dependence there is, as we said, self pity. And that self pity comes about through comparison. So, where there is dependency on another, on your wife or your husband, psychologically, there must not only be fear and pleasure, but also the, the pain of it. And I hope you are observing it in yourself, not merely listening to the speaker. You know, there are two ways of listening. To listen casually, to hear a series of ideas and agreeing or disagreeing with it. And there is another way of listening, which is not only to listen to the words and the meaning of words, but also listen to Actually, what is taking place in yourself? If you so listen, then what the speaker says is related to what you are listening to. So actually then, you are not merely listening to the speaker, which is irrelevant, but listening to the whole content of your being. And if you are listening in that way, then we are, both of us, partaking, sharing together, in what is actually taking place. But if you don't 
listen completely that way, with all your mind, with all your heart, then a meeting of this kind becomes so utterly meaningless. It's a waste of time and energy for you to come and sit here, listen to some stupid man talking about things. Whereas if you really applied, really listened with an intensity, at the same time, at the same level, then you have a passion which is going to transform that which is. So in understanding what is the actual terrible life one leads, a meaningless life, going to the office every day of your life of sixty years, of forty years, a life isolated, though you may have a wife and children and sex, in yourself <coughs> there is self-isolating process going on. And your wife or your girl or the boy is actually living in his own isolation, though they may live together in the same house, each one is isolated with his own ambitions, in his own fears, in his own sorrow. And living in this image is called relationship. Again, this is a fact. You have your image, about her, and she has her image about you. And you have your own image about yourself. And the, rela <coughs> the relationship is between these two images, and not the actual relationship. So first, one must find out how these images are constructed, how they come into being, whether they should exist, and whether what it means to live without an image. Now, how does this image come? I do not know if you ever considered this, whether a life is possible, can a life in which there is no image, no formula at all. And what it would mean a life that had no image? And we're going to find out. To find that out, you'll have to inquire into the question, how this image comes into being in our life. We have many, many experiences, all the time, conscious or experiences which you are not aware of. Each experience leaves a mark. And these marks build up day after day, and they become the image. Someone 
insults you, at that moment you have already formed the image about the other. Or someone flatters you, and again there is the image formed. So each reaction builds an image. Need it, must. A reaction build an image. Please do go consider this very serious. We're sharing together, communicating together, investigating together into this problem of Allah. The mind must inevitably create an image. And having created it, as we have, is it possible to end it? Now, f- to end an image, we must find out first why it, how it comes into being. And we see that any challenge, when it is not responded to adequately, must leave an image. Right? Is that clear? No? (laughs) So look, you call me an idiot. A fool. And you become immediately my enemy. Or I don't like you. Now, when you call me an idiot, a fool, to be intensely aware at that moment, without any choice, without any condemnation, just to listen to what you say. If there is no response, emotional response to your statement, then you will see there is no image being formed. So the question is, to be aware of the reaction and not give it time to take root. Right? Because the moment that reaction takes root, it has formed an image. Isn't that simple? Now, can you do it? Which is quite a different matter. To do it you need attention, not just dreamily wander about life. To attend at the moment of a challenge, to attend with all your being so that you listen with your heart and with your mind so that you see clearly what is being said. either an insult or a flattery, or an opinion about you, then you will say, there is no image at all. And the image is always the past. What has happened? And if it is a pleasurable image, we hold on to it. If it is an image which is not pleasurable, which is painful, we want to get rid of it. So, desire comes into being. The one we want to hold, the other we want to reject. 
and so desire bring, brings conflict. Right? To be aware of all this, to give attention to all this without any choice, but merely observe. That means, sir, as we said the other day, the speaker has not read any books about all this, and it's important to repeat it, because then you can find out for yourself then you are not living according to some psychologist or analyst or some priest or some dogma. To find out truth you have to be completely free of all that, to stand alone. And standing alone is to turn your back on society. Now, if you have observed yourself carefully, you will see that a part of your brain, which has evolved for many thousands of years, is the past. 